you're asking me to where do I think the values of an organisation come from and finally do I think that marketing has the, the remit to create or regurgitate those values yes I think it does it depends on what the marketing department or the product manager or the marketing manager concerned is wanting to do with his brand and that may well come in terms of direction from the chief executive of the company or whatever so we're not saying that everything is created in the marketing department um, if you take Hovis for example which was award winning um, advertising in the 1970s what have we seen today? We've seen that same ad just being used on Hovis, taking back those wonderful values of a little boy going up and down the street in Yorkshire. It, it's a sort of heart-rending sort of um, bit of advertising. I mean, I'm talking about somebody myself who in the 1970s was producing advertising for Duboni, which was a, a well-known French drink. Mm -hmm. And those values were soft, they were emotive, they were not what I'd call hard sell branding. One was seeking rather more to put values, if you like, on the brand, as opposed to just creating uh, a campaign for brand awareness. So one has to distinguish between brand awareness, which is the ability to know how many people in a perceived universe know, either closed or open, what the, um, what the brand awareness of the brand is. So, for example, you might ask the question of a consumer, when you think of uh, French drinks, what do you think of? And they might well say martini, they might well say red wine, and they might somehow say Duboni. That would be what you'd call unprompted brand awareness because there is no mention of the brands. If you then ask the question, when you think of French drink brands, which of those have you heard of? Martini, Duboni, Noi Pra, etc. That is what you'd call a prompted brand awareness question. And as you build up your database on that sort of thing for your market research, these are the things that you may well want to leverage in a particular campaign. So you might say in the campaign, to raise brand awareness from current level of 40% to 45% or whatever and you'd measure your campaign pre and post and if the campaign was successful and it was communicating what it was meant to communicate as a marketing or an advertising objective then you'd feel very happy as a marketing manager if your brand awareness ended up at 47 or 48 the campaign had therefore worked mm. the other thing of course is brand image and brand image has really got to do with the attributes that you're trying to sell you might be wanting to appeal more to women than to men. You might be wanting to appeal to the essential nature of the housewife as opposed to the essential nature of the mother. You might be wanting to communicate taste and texture mm. or form and line and how many flavours has it got. Is it a brand that continues to interest someone? Mm. And um, I think those things can be measured and they must be measured because if you don't measure them, you'll never have any control about whether the money that you're spending is effective or not. And that's the bottom line of it. That's a very good question. Let us take one of the world's largest brands, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola are consistently known for producing very good award-winning advertising. You know, everybody's heard of Coca-Cola. I mean, you know, there's somebody in Kazakhstan perhaps hasn't, but I mean, that's not really the point I'm making. Um, Coca-Cola's key value in the whole of its makeup is its distribution. It is not the fact that it spends more money on advertising. It, it happens to. But it is the ability of Coca-Cola to be bought in a Moscow street, a Hungarian street, and for kids in Beijing or Shanghai or Kazakhstan. I mean, that's, that's, that's the strength of Coca-Cola. It's its distribution. Um, you know, a sales force only has one real objective, and that is to get the product out into the correct distribution channels. So... That doesn't mean to say it should be in every grocery store if it's a food product. It doesn't mean to say that it should be in, in every clothing retailer, whether it's a boutique or a supermarket chain. 
because you tell the consumer something about your distribution. If you're in everywhere, you cannot possibly be an haute couture brand because there is nothing specialist in it. If you are only in a few places, you may well want to create something else down the track that then allows that particular brand that you have to become a mass market product, but immediately you have to be introducing something new and repeating what you've got Say your mother and my mother wanted to, because they were both great housewives and great cooks, and they wanted to launch a, a very specialist mustard into the marketplace, where would you want to sell it? You'd hardly want to sell it in Aldi or Netto first off. You'd want to sell it in Harrods. And then you'd want to take it from Harrods into Fortnum and Mason. And then from Fortnum and Mason, you might want to take it into Harvey Nichols. And then you might want to take it into the best grocers in the country. So you'd put it into Valvona and Crolla in Edinburgh. You'd put it into um, Peckham's in, in Glasgow and places like that. And then eventually you would sell it to one of the supermarkets. Would you choose Waitrose first on the branded side? Probably not. You might go to Tesco, but you might well want to go to Sainsbury's at the moment. I'm not saying that that's right or wrong. I'm just saying there would be an orderly way of increasing your leverage with your brand. As soon as you become mass market, you've created something different. You are not elite anymore. You are not selling your BMW 850. You're actually selling the biggest of the BMW cars, which might well be a 300 series or whatever. Well, the moment that you're going out to distribute the first product you've launched in your in your cadre of products, you immediately be wanting to add something in value back in to Harrods. So perhaps it might be honey flavoured mustard, or it might be another another form of dressing. It might be a, a mayonnaise, for example, that your mum and my mum had created. And that is how product life. I mean, Procter and Gamble don't believe in product life cycles, for example. Why should they? I mean, Persil, since it was launched in 1908, has had 72 product changes, I think. So they've gone from green bits in it to red bits in it, and all the time they're adding something new. And then suddenly somebody produced a liquid that you could put into your washing machine, and has it got Persil written on it? You bet your bottom dollar it has. And so forms, different forms of the product, then become the driving force.